Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to our Lord's House on this, the first midweek Wednesday in Lent. My name is Pastor Brian Holly. I served here some time ago, um, but have been invited back for a time, I suppose, having missed the three services in a row. I think that's a first for me, uh, so it seems rather unusual, but it sure is nice to be back with you this evening. This evening, the service is all enclosed in your little worship folder. It's basically the service of Vespers, which we've been using on our midweek services now for the last couple of years, so hopefully it'll be somewhat familiar. Uh, I am substituting a couple of hymns uh, in place of the, the Magnificat a little bit later in the service, but I suspect we'll all do quite well together. <clears throat> We'll open tonight with our first hymn. It'll be hymn number 440, Jesus I Will Ponder Now, and we'll be singing verses 1, 5, and 6. Hymn 440, verses 1, 5, and 6. <laughs>
responsively Psalm 77. Psalm 77. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot see. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated for the office hymn, which will be hymn number 445, When You Woke That Thursday Morning. Hymn 445, verses 1, 2, 4, and 5.
first Old Testament reading for this evening is from Exodus chapter 15. Moses and the people had just come across the Red Sea, and now they are praising God. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of, the Lord is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. Lord, have mercy. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 13. After reading from the Law and the Prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to Paul and Barnabas, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. So Paul stood and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring... God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as promise. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. The Passion of our Lord is recorded by St. Matthew, chapter 26. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to the disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and 
kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a man came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful, and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? Jesus said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation.
this year, during our midweek services for Lent, I've decided to take some time and focus for just a moment or two on the collects of Lent. These relatively small little prayers that are huge in their significance. You should have an insert in your bulletin that highlights the nominally five parts of a collect. And, and the name really comes from the ancient notion that in worship, all the people were to be praying. And when we normally pray the collect, we have already invoked the Lord's name and reached out to him in prayer. And here, the priest or the pastor representing the people turn and face the altar and prays for the people. It's a relatively simple prayer most weeks, but it is profound in what it requests. I'm reminded of a hymn in Lutheran service book. It's hymn number 779, and the second verse in the prayer section goes like this. Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. And so during the course of any given church year, we're treated to, to dozens and dozens of these beautiful and ancient prayers, some of them stretching back hundreds if not thousands of years. And the prayers often, not always, but often follow the same pattern. They normally begin with a, with a formal reference to the one that the prayer is directed to. We might call this an address. And so in our collect for the first Sunday in Lent, which is reproduced on your little handout, the address is, O Lord God. At other times, in other collects, it might be addressed to Almighty Father or even to Christ or to the Holy Spirit, but it's just the way the prayer is addressed. Part two then becomes some kind of rationale or an acknowledgement, a statement about God, about what he has done or promised to do. And so, in our collect for the first Sunday in Lent, it begins, You led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. And I hope and pray that you hear echoes of our Old Testament reading for tonight. When God does exactly that, He leads His people from their captivity in Egypt. He had redeemed them, freed them, saved them, and now he was leading them to the promised land. Part three of collects are typically the actual thing we're asking for, the request or the petition. In this particular prayer, it's very short. Guide the people of your church. Part four is sometimes referred to as an aspirational phrase or, or the desired outcome. Often starts with a phrase like, so that. That following our Savior echoes from our reading in Acts. We may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. We're asking for guidance to our promised land. That's big. That is no small request from this king. 
The prayer itself is small, but the idea it captures is huge. Guide the people of your church like you did Old Testament Israel and take us to the promised land. The normal conclusion for a colic then would be some kind of a termination phrase or, or a Trinitarian conclusion to kind of wrap up the whole prayer. And so in the collect for this week, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I think I discovered these collects when I was at the seminary. So for some 38 years of my life, I never paid a whole lot of attention. I didn't know they were assigned for every week and every feast and festival in the church year. And I really never paid much attention to them. But one year while I was at the seminary, I was challenged to read them, to pray them every day during the week, to do it devotionally, and to ponder what the church collectively was asking of God. At first, it seemed kind of trivial, too simple in a way, but as you slow down and begin to think a little bit, their immensity, I believe, becomes apparent. Now, as we begin Lent, we're on our way to Easter, right? Through Holy Week, Good Friday, and on to Easter. But during these next 40 days or so, could we benefit from any help, from any leading from our Heavenly Father? Do we need His help or do we have it? Do we have it figured out? We're fine on our own? Or could we benefit from following Him a little more closely? You know, ancient Israel, at time and time, time again, they thought they had it all figured out. They knew a better way. Why listen to this God? We know how to handle things. We're no dummies. Well, they were dummies. And they repeatedly turned away from God. And they needed His help again and again and again. God would call them to repentance. And as they turned in repentance and faith, He would restore them and provide once again for their ongoing deliverance and he would provide for them as they made their way through the wilderness that they knew. We too are on our way beyond Easter. We're on to a very special place. Now, tell me, if you're going to a brand new place, a place that you've never been before in your life, what's the first thing you desire? Well, some of us older ones will probably would probably desire a Rand McNally or a conveniently folded map. Others might turn to their phone and to Google and to GPS. But we need guidance, don't we? Even around here, I'm sometimes surprised at how often people will pull out their phone seeking guidance of how to find a place. If I were to send you down to Port Fouchon in Louisiana, would you have any idea where you were going? And if you do, God love you. <laughs> but it's about 15 or 20 miles past the end of the earth in South Louisiana. There's only one road to get there. If you miss it, you're toast. We need guidance. And this isn't a trivial thing. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Springfield at the hospital. Left the hospital late at night. I know how to leave the hospital. I know how to get back here. And boy, was I thankful 
because my phone's GPS was not working. So no problem. From St. John's, you head a little bit west, you hang a left, and right out of town. All was going well until the bright, flashing, road-closed sign appeared. There was a detour arrow, so I thought, okay, let's hope. And I attempted to follow the detour arrow. Well, it worked well for a turn or two. Then no more arrows. No more signs to follow. And then no more street. I could go right or I could go left. If I looked left, it appeared to be a road under construction. If I looked right, I knew I was going the wrong way. So I turned around. Thought I'd try it again. Well, about 45 minutes later, I left Springfield. And at one point, I was going through a part of town I'm not sure I should have wanted to have been in. And oh, how I wish for some guidance. It can be a scary thought. I remember years and years and years ago, my older brothers were something like, I don't know, 16 or 18, driving their brother-in-law's orange VW Beetle um, down, to, down to Evansville, Illinois. And from Kansas, that means you have to travel through St. Louis. Road construction detoured them into the heart of East St. Louis. And they were worried. They eventually made it. But I think sometimes we forget what kind of guidance we need. Now, where are you guys headed? Where am I headed? To paradise. To the promised land. On the other side of the heavenly Jordan River. Or on the other side of what may be our death here in this world. Or the other side of the last day. And I'm guessing GPS and Google won't get us there. We need another way. And you know how easily we get off track? You know how easily we're distracted in this world? You know how easily unimportant matters become like the biggest thing in the world and we neglect all the important stuff? Friends, we need guidance. And don't be so arrogant and proud that you won't ask for help. We need a divine guide to see us through the season of Lent, to help us, to guide us, to direct us, to challenge us, to stop us from taking foolish routes or ways, but someone that will lead us. And so, the collar for the first Sunday in Lent. Oh Lord God, you led your ancient Old Testament people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. So guide the people of your church patiently, at times sternly, keeping us in the right way. Guide us as a loving father would guide a beloved son or daughter. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior, our focus throughout Lent and throughout the entire church year, so that following him, we may walk through the wilderness, the dangers, the distractions and the cares of this world toward the glory of the world to come, of the promised land, the eternal, heavenly, promised land. And this we ask through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to stand for the versicle and for the hymn.
Let your prayer rise before you as incense. O 
God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 